Chapter two, uh, as we begin week two, covers the measurement of delinquency behaviors, trends and patterns in teen crime, and also discusses the uh, correlates of delinquency, uh, including race, gender, class, age, and chronic offending. Uh, High-risk children are involved in more than a million serious illegal acts each, each year, which gives rise to a number of questions. Who's committing these delinquent acts? Where are they most likely to occur? Is the juvenile crime rate increasing or decreasing? And are juveniles more likely to be victims than an adult? And to get started answering these questions, we have to know and discuss the methods used by criminologists that gather data on delinquency and the youth. So I hope you like my fancy slides here. We're going to talk about the primary sources of delinquency data. And I have the links to these sources up on uh, Moodle so you can click and have a look. Um, there are, the book tells you there are uh, three official records and surveys that the sources come from, but there's actually, there's actually four. I'm just going to drop a little hint on the, the fourth one because I think it's important um, because it's going to affect the Uniform Crime Report, which is the first one we're going to talk about. But the uh, book and what we'll talk about the most is the, the FBI's Uniform Crime Report, the National Crime Victimization Survey, and the Self-Report Survey. So let's start talking about the Uniform Crime Report. It's the most widely used source of national crime and delinquency statistics. Uh, the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigations, collects crime data from local law enforcement, prisons, and courts, basically the criminal justice system. That's what makes up the criminal justice system. The FBI compiles the information and publishes it annually, uh, the number of reported offenses by city, county, and geographical areas of the U.S. So if uh, you were to take a look at the um, UCI, you would uh, UCR you would see that it could be broken down you can look at you know the the crime data uh, on the east coast west coast the north and the south and that's uh, primarily for the seri serious crimes the serious crimes which are found in part one uh, the crimes that are designated as part one, those are serious crimes murder, robbery, rape, manslaughter, arson, assault, theft, uh, motor vehicle theft, petty, left, petty theft is falls into our number two offenses. Um, before I get there, however, um, I want to say key point, this is a key point to the UCR, that uh, these the crimes that are used in this data are reported. These are crimes that are reported and arrest made. Some crimes are never reported, and sometimes an arrest is never made. That those um, crimes do not fall under the data that is found in the UCR, and that's important. Uh, other data that is found on the UCR, characteristics of individuals arrested, gender, age, race, and also whether uh, a crime was the part one crime or a part two crime. And our part two crimes are the non-serious offenses. And it's anything that's not designated a part uh, one crime. Vandalism, liquor violations, drug trafficking. Some sex offenses fall under both part one and part two. Uh, the more serious ones like rape. And um, then there's less... Uh, serious ones too. There's a whole range of sex crimes. If you take criminal law, you'll learn all about them. Uh, so how does the FBI compile this information? Uh, they use three methods. They collect the you know the reported and discovered cases each month from law enforcement, 
And like I said, it's based on actual offenses known. It's reported. There's an arrest, right? It's either reported, it's an arrest, or it's both. You get reported, and there can be arrest. But if neither of those components are in play, then you don't, then it's not going to be articulated in the data. So three methods used. The number of crimes reported and arrests made. That's the raw data. That's one, one method they use. Uh, they do a year over year percentage, which changes in the number of crimes. They'll give us that information, how it changes year over year. And it also compiles the crime rates per 100,000. All right, let's talk about that briefly. Oh, my calculation is right on the slide. It's in the book, too. So it's the number of repeated crimes divided by the U.S. population times 100,000. And that e equals our crime rate per 100,000. And that's the other uh, method that they use to express crime data that can be found on their website. Um, is this UCR valid? Is it valid? Well, it has been uh, under suspect due to a number of reasons. There's reporting problems, law enforcement practices, and methodology uh, used. Those always play a role. Um, a number of crimes are not reported. Remember I said that, that information is not put in there is not available. So that kind of doesn't count in the data, but it's still crime that's out there, right? Uh, other problems is people lack confidence in law enforcement, right? There's no trust. They don't believe that they'll help Teens are highly unlikely to report to the police. Rather, they'll talk to their parents, consult with their parents, who may tell them you need to call the police or we need to go to the police. But sometimes that doesn't happen. The data only includes adolescents who have been caught. Who have been caught. There's fear of retaliation from the offender. Sometimes if we, it's, you know, the a family member, our aggressor is a family member or victim, so there's fear of retaliation. Um, some folks think it's not that important. If it's a more serious crime, it's more likely to be reported, but some think this is a private matter and nothing, and nothing will get done. So that's another reason why they don't get reported. Uh, victimless crimes... Drug and alcohol use, they're unaccounted for most times. Te and teens are the most likely uh, group that would account for drug and alcohol use. Uh, there's little or no social support from family or friends. This is another reason why uh, people in general, but adolescents, do not uh, report crimes. And if crimes are not reported, the data doesn't go into the U. CR. Another uh, area where the validity of the UCR is uh, reviewed, the police. Inaccurate reporting or lax reporting doesn't, you know, per what the police report may not be in line with the FBI guidelines on a crime or they fail to make an arrest, or they don't make an arrest because the police have discretion. And how police define a crime, like trespass versus burglary, or rape versus some other sex offense, rape has various definitions, that also affects the data that gets put into the UCR. Uh, also, policies of agencies play a role. You know, some agencies will hardcore arrest all adolescents who violate the law. Others follow more discretion. Others allow for local services department to handle the, handle the matter because it involves a, a young person. Uh, when I give an example of following their discretion, they may pick up 
a teen who is uh, loitering or using alcohol and rather than arrest them, bring them home to their parents and have their parents deal with the issue. Uh, so these reporting issues, what happens? It leads to kind of inaccurate data. Um, also, you know, arrests may reflect things like race, ethnicity, age, gender, the biases uh, in those. Um, another area affecting uh, the data in the UCR is uh, the key. They only report the uh, one the one charge, one serious crime. So let's say we have a, an individual who convict who uh, who conducts or is charged with multiple charges and then convicted of multiple charges. The FBI is only going to take the serious crime. So if we're dealing with a armed robbery and the clerk is injured and the person flees, stealing a car, and then while taking off in the car, hits a whole bunch of cars and, and property causing damage, right? There's a number of charges that can be done in that scenario. That person can be charged and convicted of in that scenario. But the FBI's methodology of taking only the serious crime, the armed robbery is the one that's going to be accounted for. So that is a issue. Um, also, the number of teenagers arrested does not reflect the actual number of youths who have committed delinquent acts because why only arrests are reported also others are counted more than once the number reported does not set apart whether one particular teen has committed numerous offenses because each offense is only counted once right so if two million teens are arrested that does not mean two million teens committed the crime it could be five hundred thousand committing the crime but despite these discrepancies, it is considered a reliable source of information for criminal statistics. And I know I already clicked my slide to the survey research, but I do want to interject a, a couple more points before I delve into that. Um, the FBI's UCR is the largest, most common data on crime that's available. It's also considered a highly reliable indicator of crime patterns and trends. We'll talk about trends and patterns in a moment. Uh, their objective is to generate reliable information to use in law enforcement, administration, operation, and management. And within the UCR are four other databases, the National Incident Based Reporting System, the Summary Reporting System, Law Enforcement Officers Killed and Assaulted Program, and Hate Crime Statistics. You should be aware that those are found in the database as well. Um, one official reporting uh, database, not mentioned in the book, but I will take a minute to bring it to your attention. It is linked in Moodle as well. It's the National Incident-Based Reporting System, NIBRS. It was created to improve the overall quality of the crime data collected by law enforcement. And this system is unique because it collects data on crimes reported to the police and incidences where there's multiple crimes committed. So like take for that last example I have, the robbery that escalates to a rape, both of those charges are going to be uh, reported. And it will, the database also collects information on victims, known offenders, relationships between the victims and the offenders, the arrestees, and the property involved in a crime. So it has a lot more information and a lot more crimes are covered in, in this reporting system. And I bring this up because this reporting system, the National Incident-Based Reporting System, is slated to replace the UCR in January, January 1st, 2021. So need to know it's kind of it's out there and the other one is going to disappear so to speak or be uh, consumed with it all right let's move on to survey research measuring delinquency with survey research what a survey is well a survey is asking people about certain things like their attitudes beliefs values characteristics that's what these surveys do um the sampling is it selected from a number of people that's represented uh, or representative of, of the whole 
or the population, and a population is considered a group that's similar in nature with their characteristics. So that's you know, the basic gist of a search survey. There's different ways to um, conduct a survey. We're going to talk about a, a couple that are important here with regards to collecting uh, uh, data on delinquency. We have victim victimized, I'm sorry, victimization studies. These are the victims. We're talking about the victims of cases. And this is where uh, there's an attempt to fill in where those police reports are missing because uh, they're asking people if they've ever been convicted of, of a crime in a given year. And this could be whether the crime was reported or not recorded. So. Uh, the first one we are going to talk about is the National Crime Victimization Survey, or the NCVS for short. This is the primary source of information on criminal victimization in the United States. This helps fill in the gaps of the UCR and the NIBRS because the data is only crime, that data is only crimes known to the police. Um, how is it conducted? How, do, how is this survey conducted by the U.S. Census Bureau? They do the administration on this. So they administer the survey and they gather the data on frequency, characteristics, and consequences of criminal victimization from about approximately 200,000 people. That's their sample. Uh, and the age range is from 12 years old and older. And it's done twice a year every six months, and their sample of households they keep for a period of three years, and they rotate new ones in. And the information is on non-fatal personal crimes, such as sexual assault, robbery, regular assault, and larceny, and also um, property crimes, household property crimes, burglary, motor vehicle theft, and other uh, theft crimes, whether, and these things are whether reported or not reported. And there's a link to this uh, website as well to review the data. The data is considered unbiased and a valid estimate. However, as you can potentially see that there are some problems or challenges or limitations in the type of data the recall, the recall of the victimization, right? It might lead to uh, over-reporting or under-reporting with the recall of the incident or the person's traumatized and which can lead to an incident being blurred or not being remembered or recalled very well. What might be another issue? Victim might lie or might omit information. Why would they do that? Guilty, fear, lack of trust, shame possibly. Could be uncomfortable with the interviewer. The responding group may actually not be represented, may not be representing the population or the nation as a whole. Faulty questions, faulty format questions can result to improper answers or inadequate answers. And sometimes the fear of reporting in and of itself, they don't want to report. They don't report at all. So it is a valid source, valid estimate and considered unbiased, but there are some uh, limitations that should be thought about when reviewing the answers. Then we have self-reporting statistics. Now we just finished talking about victims who are reporting. When we talk about self-reporting uh, statistics, we are talking about stats that are reported by individuals. Um, this information is uh, self-reporting and it will get and it gets gathered when people are asked to report the number of times that they may have committed a particular crime during a set period 
in the past, regardless of getting caught or not. So what do we see as the difference here? What do we see as the difference here? The last one was focused on the victim. This one's focusing on the offender. Okay, so they're asking about some asking someone whether or not they've committed a crime or what types of crimes they have committed. Now, the assumption is uh, that these individuals who are reporting on these surveys are candid because it's, administ it's administered anonymously, okay? And the point is to measure crimes that would neither be reported to the police nor show up in the victim surveys, like using illegal substances. That's something that wouldn't show up in the victim service uh, surveys because it's a victimless crime. And the point is to reach the quote unquote dark figures. Those are the things that can't, those are the, the data can't get at by these other reporting services. They're mostly administered in schools because attendance is universal and represents a cross section of the community, but it's not restricted to that. It's usually conducted annually. So how, how valid are they? Are there any limitations? Can we have exaggeration or underreported criminal behavior? Sure. If we're talking about adolescents, some might not be so candid about their legal behavior. Some might be over-exaggerated about it. Some may not even know what they've done was a crime. So it might not get reported. They might forget, may not get a large enough sample or focus on, you know, drugs versus suspension, or, you know, it might not be accurate in results if you're looking for a more, you know, more serious crimes, might be dealing with more uh, lesser deviant activities like truancy or curfew violations. Some may not want to cooperate at all especially if they know they've been involved in numerous crimes or even serious ones. So, how valid are they? There are certainly pros and cons to all of these crime data sources. My question is, can these statistics ever be misused once, once they're out there and known? It does happen all the time whether it's done intentionally or accidentally. The, mis the misuse of statistics promotes what, crime myths, generates fear of crime. What type of ways can you already think about that crime statistics and data can be misused? When there's a limited public access to the, cri the information, critical information. How about intending to mislead the public? by presenting false information, using deceptive formats to present information. Who might, uh, who would do that? Examples of who might misuse this kind of data. The media, I hope you're all shouting out the media, politicians, government officials in general, organizations, they may want to persuade an issue one way or another with regards to crime. The pharmaceutical industry likes to uh, skew the um, war on drugs, right? They want to keep marijuana illegal, even though it had, despite of all of the benefits it has in the medical field, what? Well, it's going to affect the pharmaceutical company. Why? So they want it. They want, they use data. That's where they get their data from. They also pay criminologists to create data, but that's where we're going down the down the wrong page. Let's, do, let's stick with our uh, adolescents here. Uh, there are other sources of uh, evaluating crime data that criminologists use. It is uh, in the book, page 39. I have them here up on, uh, I'm sorry, what I have here is the primary evaluating the primary data sources. What I want you to do is take a look at these sources against the other available sources, which is on page 39 of the book that criminologists use in their studies to measure delinquency uh, behavior. But this is the overall, this is like a little summary 
overall of what the important uh, aspects are to each of the databases we we discussed and that I'd like for you to be aware of. Uh, the alternative measures of delinquency behavior. These are outlined, like I said, in the book. Uh, the cohort research data where um, criminologists observed over time a, a group, the same group of people for, for an extended period of time, and they'll share certain characteristics. And we are actually going to look at that type of research uh, shortly when we discuss chronic offending. There are a perfect database or the research that uh, a cohort research data that was used using a group of boys through a period of their lifetime to determine whether or not chronic, uh, how chronic offending occurs. We will look at that. Certainly there's experimental uh, data, observation, interview research, and the meta-analysis and systematic review. These are other ways that criminologists gather information on delinquent uh, behavior. So we are going to turn now with taking this data from these sources and looking at the crime trends and crime patterns of delinquency that uh, criminologists have determined occur as a result.